Hello and welcome. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. This is our special live stream to answer your questions about the coronavirus. Joining me is Dr Norman Swan, ABC medical expert and the host of RN's Health Report. He is highly respected and has had a long career in guiding Australians through matters of health and medicine. Dr Swan, welcome to the live stream. Thanks, Jeremy. Good your to checks have you in the meal. <laughs> now, we're taking your questions on coronavirus about what to worry about, what not to worry about. So you can leave them in the comments below. In fact, we've already had several hundred on the uh, Facebook feed. Uh, the uh, YouTube feed is being opened up for your comments and questions as well. And we've had several thousand coming in through the ABC News website as well. So we've tried to get through as many of those as we can. Uh, let's go to this question from Howard Burns, uh, Dr Swan. In simple terms, why is this any worse than last year's particularly virulent flu season? What's the difference? Um, well, probably more people were infected. It's a very good question, what's different from the flu season? There's a couple of things different. One is that the mortality rate, in other words, the, the chances of dying compared to the total number infected is several times more with coronavirus. So it's about 0.1 with seasonal flu, 0.1% of total number, and it's probably around 1% with coronavirus. So more people get sick and die, um, although it's a different group slightly different group of people who get sick and die and there's no vaccine so there's no there's no there's no treatment and no vaccine so so how worried should we be i mean there's this sort of question about what information we can trust what sources of information we can trust and whether this is either a beat up or whether we're not being given all the information all the facts well it's not a beat up and the best thing that could happen here is that it's a total fizzer and the doom and gloom predictions don't happen. That's, that's what everybody actually wants to happen. We don't want to ignore it and then we have a nightmare on our hands. So the issue here is, and it's actually one, it's a, it's a statistical question, uh, issue. The individual risk for you and me is really low. Particularly if you're at the younger age of the spectrum. That's right. So there's a straight line almost in terms of severity. And, uh, well, and it certainly jumps after the age of 40, so it's not quite a straight line. So if you're young and fit and healthy, the chances of getting seriously ill and dying are around about 0%. It's very, very low. Whereas if you're 80 years old and you've got heart disease and diabetes or lung disease, your chances of dying could be anything up to 15%. So it does depend on your age and who you are. But also... Even though the number of cases are increasing quite quickly in Australia, it's still very low numbers. So it's a handful of people in a country of 25 odd million people. So the chances of you catching it from somebody else at the moment are really low. The issue is us all pulling together as a community to lower the risk as a community and slow the whole thing down. Because if a million Australians get it, Five to 10,000 people will die, and a lot more than those people will end up in an intensive care unit, taking up ventilators and what have you. Bad for them, but also means that if you've got a heart attack and you need coronary artery bypass surgery, there may not be a bed available for you to be treated. Or if you've got cancer and need cancer surgery, there may not be a bed or an intensive care bed. So we block the system and the system stop, the healthcare system stops working. That's the population one. So the chances of us getting it over time, probably quite high. Chances of getting into problems, quite low but the impact on the whole system is huge. On that age curve of vulnerability, uh, what about babies? What about people who are maybe pregnant right now or thinking about having a child? Um, it looks as though, unlike flu, a seasonal flu, that young children either don't catch it or if they do, they get a very mild, um, mild disease. That's it's not clear why that is. It could be about the young person's immune system. Um, the way the virus interacts with it, or it could be, because this is a family of coronaviruses, which are the common cold. So if you've got a toddler and they're in a daycare, you know, every parent knows they come back with every infection under the sun. So they get a lot of infections early on. It's quite possible that they have a little bit of immunity already to this coronavirus group of viruses, because that's what gives you the, one of the things that gives you the common cold. Nobody knows. If you're pregnant, a really interesting question. So it's early days. We've only known about this for the last few weeks internationally. I mean, it sounds as if it's forever now, but it's it not. Does. So there have been small studies of pregnant women in China. And, but not, because it hasn't gone nine months, we've got no studies of people early on in pregnancy. It looks as though if you're late in pregnancy, in the last trimester, there may be a small risk of fetal distress, a small risk of born slightly early. There's no evidence, <coughs> pardon me, 
that the mother can transmit the virus to the baby, so the babies aren't being born positive for coronavirus. Nobody has been able to grow coronavirus in breast milk. It doesn't mean to say it's not transmitted. So the current advice for breastfeeding mothers, if they're infected, is continue breastfeeding. But if you're infected, you know, wear a face mask, because that's one situation where a face mask does work if you've got it. Uh, wash your hands and so on, try not to transmit it to the baby. Um, but babies in some senses, can be quite resilient. All right, I want to go to another question from Alice Clare. Alice, thank you for your question that's coming on Facebook. What is the mortality rate in Australia likely to be, and would it be different from what we've seen in places like Wuhan? The answer is it is probably going to be different. It's already different in Wuhan the, the, because we don't know the total number of people infected. So it's 2% or so from the known number of people who are infected. But the mathematical modelling suggests that it's many times that. Um, and so the current consensus is that it's somewhere between 0.6% and 1% mortality. Now, you can get that... So even though when I say there's no treatment for coronavirus, there actually is a tr there are treatments for severe disease. It involves intensive care. It involves ventilation till you get, so your immune system gets rid of the virus. And sometimes in really severe cases, which is what they do in flu pandemics, is they put you on what's called ECMO. And effectively, that's heart-lung bypass. They completely rest the heart and lungs until the virus goes from your body. The disturbing thing about this virus is that it may be similar to SARS when you think the whole problem's in the chest, but there's a little bit of evidence that it infects the brain as well and infects the part of the brain that helps you to breathe. And one of the respiratory problems is that your brain is not driving your respiratory system to breathe. And that, but you get over that with a few days in intensive care and ECMO. But some people will still die because they're very sick. So we've had a lot of questions about uh, the contagiousness of this and how you know you've even got coronavirus. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to sort of summarise with a question here uh, from Dean Marzal, who sent in a question through Facebook. Uh, after initial infection, when do you become infectious? When does it become contagious to other people? Is it within days or only when you are showing symptoms? The problem with this virus is that you're infectious before the symptoms come out and you can be infectious even if you never get symptoms but you're infected. So one study a couple of weeks ago showed that, uh, and it's a small study, but they, in one individual they were asymptomatic throughout and they had just as much virus in their body as somebody who was showing symptoms. So asymptomatic people can spread it and you can spread it before you get infected. The incubation period is probably on average around five days, but there's a lot of variation around that. It could be a bit shorter or longer, which is why they play safe. 14 days is, is very safe. There was talk of it being up to 21 days or four weeks as well. Yeah, I, I think those are probably very rare cases if they're indeed right at all. And when you're actually infectious before the virus, it's probably two days or something like that before that. But even then, there's debate about that. Although we, we are learning quite a lot from the Chinese epidemic. How is the virus transmitted? I mean, if you've got the virus and you're in quarantine, can you duck out to the shops for 15 minutes or go put petrol in the car? I think it's misleading this story. Well, you've got to be in contact with somebody for 15 minutes or six minutes and it's really quoted because we don't understand the spread yet. Although there's a very interesting paper yesterday in the Journal of the American Medical Association and which looked at spread in a small number of people. We'll come to, back to that in a minute. So we know that there's droplets, we know that it lands on surfaces and it can la last on surfaces for more than, you know, several, it can be several days, a bit like SARS was, uh, a, bit, a, a bit like SARS. I can cough and you can breathe it in, but it's often just by touch, hands to the face is the main thing. However, this study that was done, very small number of people, it's only three patients actually in Singapore, two of whom were quite sick and one of whom had very mild symptoms and they were all in hospital and they measured samples before and after um, it, it was cleaned with disinfectant. And two of the patients, they didn't pick up anything on, on the surface around. The patient who wasn't that sick, uh, it's just one patient, but wasn't that sick, had coronavirus in their stool, the toilet bowl, the sink, the storage area where the hospital staff were going to get their protective equipment was infected. Basically, a large area around this person was infected. So if you're pushing this virus out, it can infect almost anything. 
and it looks as if it's inside your bowel as well. And does that transmit through whatever you touch or is it through your breath as well? It, well, breath, if I were to cough and there were droplets in my breath, then yes. Right. Which is why if you've, this is the one situation where masks are worth having is if you've got it, you wear it to stop passing, to reduce the droplet spread from your, from your, from your uh, mouth and nose. Um, and if you're a health worker, that's why we've got to save the mask for health workers, you're dealing with people all the time. And the problem for health workers is the severity of the illness is partly related to how much virus you get. So it's dose related. If you just pick up a little bit of the virus, you may only get a mild infection. But if you get a lot of it, still to be proven, but it happens with other infections, you get more severe ones, which is probably why that young doctor died in China. He was probably looking after people, so, you know, giving out a lot of virus. This is the one who raised the alarm That's right. very early and on. he you know, tragically died, and, you know, and, and young, as opposed to the fact that... And he probably got a whopping dose of it. Uh, Alex Smith has sent in a question, going back to the sort of the age curve that we were talking about. Alex says, I have a parent with a heart condition. I've read that kids show mild symptoms. I'm concerned though that my kids could spread it to my parents unknowingly. At what point should I be keeping my kids away from their immunocompromised grandparents? So presuming the kids are not showing any symptoms, should you yeah. keep them away from someone who is I think, I think the suppressed in some form? I think the advice at the moment, I, I'm not obviously going to be careful, I hope I'm not contradicting the official advice, but the, the advice at the moment is if you've got no known contact with somebody who's got coronavirus, then you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't change the way you behave and the way that you live. You certainly shouldn't use, be using masks. You, probably, you should not be travelling overseas unless you have to because you don't want to get it stuck overseas and be in a place and then bring it back. So you know, it's prudence. If you have not come in contact with fever or unexplained symptoms, then um, the risk is extremely low at the moment. Now, if we've got a million people in Australia, which we don't have with the virus, then the plot changes considerably. And you might actually call children back from parents, although children don't seem to be a major part of the problem. Difficult issue. The other issue people have been asking about is, well, if I've got it, how do I isolate myself? And so here you've got to differentiate between whether you're a contact of somebody. So the whole, the whole policy at the moment is find people who've got it, find people who've come in contact and isolate the lot so you slow down the spread of the virus. So if you've got it, you can go home, you need to isolate yourself and try and isolate yourself from the rest of the family. But the whole family doesn't need to be locked down. If you've got it, however, and you've been in close contact with the rest of your family, probably the family does. But you need to get advice on this, and there's a national helpline to help you get through that. Uh, you mentioned this question about going overseas. I can't remember who the uh, user was on our Facebook channel who asked this question, should I cancel my overseas holiday? I think she was booked to go on a cruise uh, in the next few months. I think next month, in fact, in April. Would you be advising people to rethink that? It's a difficult thing for you, obviously. But so it's just, it's <laughs> do as I say or do as I do. So do as I do, I've actually cancelled an overseas trip. Right. And the reason I've cancelled an overseas trip is I'm not that worried about catching coronavirus. I think I'll be okay. Um, I'm more worried that I get stuck overseas and I can't get back for three or four weeks and I'm busy here talking to you, Jeremy, and I won't be able to do that. So I've cancelled for the time being, but I'm thinking, well, maybe by July things will be okay. Um, although I'd be hesitant to go to Italy. So you've got to exercise prudence. I would not walk onto a cruise ship, to be honest. So I'm talking about me now. Yep. The, um, these are incubators for viruses, not just coronavirus, but for diarrheal disease and so on. Once, it's, once it spreads, it's very hard for the cruise company to control it, as we saw with the Diamond Princess. These are not good places to be when the epidemics are around. Sorry if I'm damaging the cruise uh, industry here. But I'm only talking about me. I wouldn't go on a cruise. That uh, question was from Anne-Marie Chant, and lots of users also yeah, well, chimed in there. Send us a postcard, Anne-Marie. Yeah, We'd love to see it. Anne -Marie, I'm sure it'll be a great cruise. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Tamara asks the question, Tamara Seftra, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, what about interstate travel, given that New South Wales and Victoria have the largest amount of cases? Uh, what's the likelihood of seeing... I wouldn't be worrying about interstate travel in the, in the slightest at the yeah. moment. I mean, these are tiny numbers. There's five million people in New South Wales, but a similar number of people in Victoria, and we've got you know, 20, 30 cases. By the end of the weekend, there'll be double that at least, but it's still only a handful of people in a state of several million people. So you would not, uh, you know, if one of the, our states had several thousand 
and one had 20, well, you might start to think about it. But at the moment, it's pretty evenly spread throughout the country and it, there's no particular risk with travel. Different question is, should there be a conference of 3,000 people um, mixing, particularly overseas guests coming from there? You know, that's a difficult question to answer at the moment. Judy Peterson has asked this question. If a person has recovered from the virus, has had it, has, the, has recovered, can they be reinfected for a second time or are they immune? The really important question. And there was a little signal a couple of weeks ago that maybe you could be reinfected. But what it's, what it's likely to be, we don't have a good blood test for this to show antibodies. So normally you know when you're recovering you can do blood tests and so on. It turns out that the test that they're doing at the moment is a pretty good test, but it's not that sensitive. And the, you may have the virus in your body for a bit longer than they otherwise would have thought. There is no, and, and what's happened is that the virus test may actually be negative when it's really positive, and then it turns up positive a week or so later, but it's actually been positive all along, right. and you haven't been reinfected. The test, I think, at the moment is not good enough to be sure about that. So there's no solid evidence of reinfection, and nobody knows yet how long you're immune for. And that's a really important question, as a great question, for the vaccine. So if you get a vaccine, is it going to be like flu, and uh, you need it every year? And that will be partly how, <coughs> how this virus is mutating, which is another, it's been really some interesting research in the last 24 or 48 hours on that too. Uh, Kate Norman has been engaging a lot on our uh, Facebook feed, um, saying she's looking at having tests done at home versus going to the doctor. Um, what sort of tests can someone get from the doctor? Because it doesn't seem like everyone is necessarily eligible for a COVID-19 test. Is that right? Um, well, I think that if you think you've been in contact with somebody or you're unwell, then they are doing testing. And I think they're pretty open about testing. I don't think that we're as restrictive as they've been in the United States, for example. So I don't, and I think probably the, it varies. I think, the, so let's just double back. You're worried. What are you going to do? You, you think you may have been in contact with your somebody. There's a national helpline, which you can phone. I think it's 1-800-020-080 from memory, but we can be sure about that later which will help you with some of the decision making. You probably should not, unless you're really sick, you, if you're just mildly unwell and a bit uncertain, you know, you've got a bit of a headache, you've got a bit of a cough, you're not quite sure, phone your GP or phone the National Helpline or phone the emergency department. An increasing number of Australian public hospitals will have fever clinics where you can turn up and uh, if they're concerned, they will test you. Increasingly though, we can't afford the hospital beds to have everybody who might be positive in a bed and isolated. You'll be sent home and you'll be sent home into home quarantine. And if you get sick, then, then you'll be admitted. Um, home testing, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, the testing's got to be done by somebody who knows how to do the test. And it can be a combination of nose throat swabs. I think in some states it's mostly a throat swab yeah. and they try and get sputum up as well. To so test so Helen sputum. asked this question, is it a blood test or a mouth swab? Is it a chest uh, CT scan or an X-ray? They only do, so it's, it, my understanding is um, it's a throat swab, and if they can get sputum up, they get a sputum sample because the receptor for the virus is in the lungs as well. Um, and there isn't a good antibody test yet for a, a blood test, which is what they do for, say, HIV or other, or other tests. Um, so that's how they, they do the test at the moment. So it's got to be done properly uh, by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, and, so, and so chest X-ray and yep. CT are only if you've got symptoms and the doctor's worried about you. Um, it's not a routine part of the process. Terry Crowther asks a really good question. What are the best precautions Australia and Australians can do at a local level? And what he's getting at here is that the precautions in a city, in a dense neighbourhood, are quite different from what you might find on a farm or in regional Australia. You might, except that, you know, regional cities are regional cities and there's lots of people around. Um, I think that, so I think a lot of this is on personal responsibility and a sense of uh, so social responsibility where if you are feeling unwell and you've got a virus, that you should um, stop mixing with people, keep away from them, wash your hands. Um, it may be a case that, that you're the person who for a while should wear a mask just to see how you're going. Talk to your doctor, talk to the National Helpline, talk to your local hospital, they'll, they'll have a protocol for dealing with you. So if everybody kind of, most people do that, some people won't, but most people do that, then 
that will control the virus quite well. So it's a sense of personal responsibility. In terms of the rest of us, it's going to be really unusual for us to come across somebody in the street. Um, and even if we do and we just pass them by, really unlikely that we're going to catch it from them. It's more intimate contact than that or surfaces. So it's about washing your hands. Um, it's about trying not to touch your face. And it's about washing your hands regularly. And soap is actually pretty good because soap gets rid of the fat layer on your skin where viruses often live. Hand sanitizer is fine. Um, and that keeps you on the road. You can't keep on going into the bathroom. And if you've got hand sanitizer, that's great. But soap and water, old fashioned soap and water, is really good for this. I was on the train yesterday and someone coughed. And it was this really interesting situation. Everybody Everyone just sort of like turned around and sort of tried to be yeah. polite, but you could see the anxiety rising up. So is that a, is that a different coughing, way you can't? Yeah. That's how you cough into your sleeve. And that or takes into a care tissue. of it? That just takes care of the droplets sort of flying well, around? Well, it, it minimizes it, yeah. You yep. can't guarantee it. Uh, or a tissue. A number of people, including Kimberly Forrester, asking the question at what point does the government accept advice to? closed schools, universities, public transport? Well, is there a benchmark there? No. Um, it, you know, it's, it's judgment. So they've closed the schools in Italy for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think Korea has clamped down on it too. Now, that's what you do in a flu pandemic because children are super spreaders. So if children get infection, they are super spreaders. And so, um, and they did it with uh, Zika virus as well. They, 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 they stopped try to stop children spreading it. It's unclear at the moment the extent to which children are super spreaders of this, even though they don't get many symptoms, so we don't know. So, it's, so when they close schools, they're likening this to an influenza pandemic, epidemic or pandemic, and they actually don't know whether that will be effective. Um, so it could be unnecessarily disruptive because children might not be a problem in this one. Uh, this term, pandemic, a lot of members of the public people like me, but also policymakers, leaders, politicians have also been hanging on this word about whether this is declared a pandemic or not. What is the difference and is it important from a medical point of view? No, it's probably more important from a media point of view that we mm. get a better headline yep. that this is a pandemic. It's been a pandemic now for a while. The WHO doesn't even use the term anymore, does it? Well, it can, not really. They, they talk about global emergency and so on and they, they try to avoid the word pandemic. It doesn't really have a lot of meaning. Well, you can say, oh, yes, it's happening in every continent in the world. Um, but it also has a sense that it's running, running riot and it's killing millions of people. We, we have all sorts of things in our mind when the word pandemic is used, and it's not very useful. What we have here is a global epidemic, which is going to infect a lot of people. And unless we slow it down as long as we can, um, large numbers of Australians will be infected and large numbers will die um, even though the individual risk is, is small. Um, and whether you call it a pandemic or a global epidemic doesn't really matter. It's, it gives it a sense of urgency. Uh, Janice Williams asks this question. Are recovered patients being used to get immunoglobulin for the treatment of the most severe cases? Great question. Don't know the answer to it. But it's, it, that's what's happened in previous, in, in other, in, ancient, in olden times. When I say olden times, you know, I'm talking about, say, the, the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. That's what they tried. They, they, they took, they had primitive notion of what the immune system was. And they knew that the serum had something in it that, co that created immunity. And they tried to spin it down and re-inject it. It was actually quite dangerous. But it's not a silly question that you get what's called hyperimmune globulin from people who've been infected and you, and you refine it down and inject it back in, and it can work. But they're also testing other treatments as well. So there's um, a drug called uh, remesid remesidivir, or remesid remesid I might have it slightly wrong there, I was pronouncing. It's which, an existing drug. It's an existing drug which is effective against MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus. And they're testing that on SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus. And they're... Um, and there are various other drugs. The Chinese have been throwing everything at this, anti-flu drugs and anti-retroviral drugs for HIV and so on. Um, but the, we've got to slow that down to see what works. Because some of these drugs are horribly expensive and I do have side effects. So you don't want to give it unless you have to. Uh, Carrie Deshira from our Facebook feed asks this question. I suffer from chronic asthma and I'd like more detail. At what point do I need to seek medical assistance given the strain that the hospital system is already likely to be under? I know what symptoms require me to go to the doctor, go to my emergency department or 
call an ambulance. However, because this is a new virus, I don't know what to expect. So what symptoms should I be keeping out for and at what point she should be going for help? Okay. Anybody with asthma mm. must have their asthma under good control. The reason we got the thunderstorm asthma event, which you would remember two or three years in ago, Victoria. anybody yeah. watching us from Victoria will know this. One of the reasons it was so bad was there were a lot of people in the community who thought their asthma was well treated and it wasn't. And they were getting symptoms like uh, coughing when they ran or walked fast, waking up during the night coughing, wheezing first thing in the morning. But it wasn't that bad and compared to what I was, it was much better. And they're sucking like nothing on earth on their blue puffer. Mm. If that's you, you're, you've got asthma and it needs to be controlled and you need to be on preventer medication because moving into a, an epidemic like, like this, if your asthma is not well under control, you are going to be vulnerable. So I'm not trying to scare people here. So you've got to actually be very assertive with your general practitioner. So this person sounds as if they have an asthma management plan. That's great. That's exactly what you need. You've got to be on adequate doses and taking of the preventer medication. It tends to be brown puffers or inhalers. And, um, and get that asthma and doing your pulmonary function testing if you've got chronic asthma so your lungs are in as good a shape as they can possibly be. And in that case, you are no different from, if you're in good shape with your asthma, you're probably not that much different from the regular uh, person in the street and it's getting symptoms that you don't know the explanation for, coming in contact with somebody who might have coronavirus. There wouldn't be any other trigger. But what you've got to do, if you're a smoker, you've got to stop smoking now because smoking damages the lining of the lungs and will make you more susceptible to this virus. Not proven, but very likely, and it damages your immune system. So this is not me just bullshitting on, using this as an excuse to get people to stop smoking. Smoking is pernicious, and that doesn't matter which vegetable you're smoking or you know, yep. the green thing you're smoking, yep. whether it's marijuana or tobacco, they're both damaging your lungs. And if you've got asthma, get it under control. Really important message, and get immunized against influenza as well. Uh, in, in that case where you're needing to get your asthma under control, you might be worried about the supply of medicines. This brings up the question of panic buying medicines. How would you deal with that, particularly if you have an underlying condition? Um, so this is a much more important question than toilet paper. Yes. <laughs> um, so a, a couple of weeks ago, the, the government was saying you should stock up on, if you've got chronic disease, that you should stock up on medicine. But that doesn't mean a year's supply. It probably means, you know, if you've got a script from your doctor with a couple of repeats, you might want to fill in one and one repeat, but not three repeats. So what do you, and can you put a number on how many months, weeks supply you well, might? It depends on the medicine, medicine right. but that's probably a couple of months, right. you know, in your cupboard. In a couple of months, this will be sorted out. Um, th there's probably more of a concern in the United States where I think they're more dependent on the Chinese supply chain for pharmaceuticals. I think it's unlikely we're going to get into serious strife with medicines unless there is an unholy run on medicines. But I, you know, I just make sure that, you know, if you've got asthma, you've got a, you know, a month's supply in the cupboard. And, you know, and if you're on other medications, just make sure you, you're, you're not running low on it and you, you keep up. But, you know, if you get a year supply, you're going to contribute to a real problem with shortages in the community, artificial shortages. So that question relates directly to asthma. What about other conditions? Are there other conditions that people really need to think about getting on top of before this hits in any yeah, sort of you, way? Yeah, diabetes affects your immune system. So you, um, if you've got type 2 diabetes, you know, you probably want to be much more active about controlling your diabetes, getting your weight down, so your blood sugar is under control because that affects your immune system, it affects your cardiovascular symptom. It's not proven that that's going to help you with coronavirus, but you would really want to just get on top. Use this opportunity now, before it spreads widely, to get your chronic disease better under control. If you've got heart failure, for example, then you want to be taking the medications your doctor is prescribing, you want to be weighing yourself regularly, um, and you want to be controlling your salt intake so that your heart failure is, is well under control. Because you might find yourself in the situation where you go to the emergency department and it's clogged with people with coronavirus, You'd, apart from the fact that you don't want to be in bad shape yourself. If you've got type 1 diabetes, which is insulin dependent, you, you just want to make sure that you've got enough insulin in the house to last you a while. Uh, what's a while? A month or two maybe? I'd, you know, nobody knows the answer to that question, but don't stock up in six months because that's going to create a shortage. Any chronic illness, make sure that you're getting on top of it if you can. So we're talking to Norman Swan, our resident medical expert and host of RN's Health Report, about all your questions to do with the coronavirus. Send them in. We're getting a 
tons of questions, thousands in fact. Leave your comments if you're watching on Facebook, uh, leave your comments in the comment section below. Same with YouTube and you can email us through the uh, ABC News website as well. Uh, we had this question here from uh, Warwick Lynch off uh, our Facebook feed. In locations where there's a controlled air supply, such as cruise ships and shopping centres, aeroplanes I suppose, I guess, uh, is there a process where the reticulation process of the air can kill the virus? Um, well, the airlines say that they've got um, medical grade filters which filter out viruses. And this is what we saw when they were doing those mercy dashes to Wuhan. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if that's on cruise liners, but it, it could exist on cruise liners. I mean, these are highly technical filters mm. and probably easier to install in a controlled environment like an aeroplane. Um, regular air conditioning, no. They've got filters, but I don't think, you know, they don't have filters that are hospital great as far as I'm aware, mm. which is why things like Legionnaire's disease can be a problem with some air conditioning systems. So it depends on the age of the air conditioning system, how it's how the technology behind it. Um, it's above my pay grade a bit in terms of really describing this. So I think there's probably an element of risk here, but nobody's really saying that reticulation of the air is the, is the, is the problem with this. It's more about surfaces. The caveat here is they still don't know enough about how this is spread. So it's possible, but I think if it was if it was real, we would have seen much more spread than we've seen now, given that air conditioning is so pervasive. Elisa Dub uh, asks this question, how long does the virus stay alive once it's released into the atmosphere, say, you know, lands on a kitchen bench or on a car surface, your car door? Um, SARS lived up to maybe four days um, and there's a little bit of evidence that this one might be the same. So unless you've cleaned the surface with some disinfectant, it could last for quite a while. Jane Ibbotson asks, I'm taking immunosuppression medications. Should I stop taking them? No, definitely not. So people will take immunosuppression medications for lots of reasons. So this is a live issue in an mm. advanced country like Australia. There are tens of thousands of people who are immunosuppressed. They've had a transplant, an organ transplant. They've got cancer you know, cancer treatment, cancer chemotherapy, or they're, they've got an autoimmune disease and they're taking um, one of those biologics and that does suppress the immune system a bit. The answer is no, because the immune suppression is treating a real condition which needs to be continued to be treated. You need to talk to your specialist. Um, I'm not sure there's advice out there at the moment, but you probably just need to be a bit more vigilant than the average person and your trigger for seeking advice would be pretty low. Um, and I think that the hospital treating you would want that. They would want to know if, if you're on immune suppression, most of the advice you get from your specialist is spiking in fever. This is long before coronavirus. You need to give us a phone to find out what's going on here in case we need to do blood cultures and so on. Same would apply here. So and a really important message there, don't stop taking any medication um, all of a sudden. Quite the opposite. If you fear you may or may not have coronavirus. Don't make any drastic No, no, it, it's quite the opposite. You want to be in ship-shape health. And if by taking your medications put you, puts you in better health, that's what you've got to do because it will make you much more resilient if you should you get infected. Uh, uh, Kerbalet uh, asks through our YouTube channel, why won't we have to do what China is doing with regard to quarantining entire cities to slow down the infection? Good luck with that. <laughs> we're, not, we're not an authoritarian state. I mean, public health acts do have the powers to do that. If somebody's wandering around as a super spreader and being wanton about it, we can actually take them in and confine them. But we're, we just don't have the social control in Australia to shut, shut it down. And then, you know, how do you do it? Where's the edge of our cities? You know, the, the edge kind of evaporates. So if you're in Melbourne, it goes into the Dandenongs and out towards Wonthaggy and so on, and Sydney out into the hills, the same with Adelaide and Perth and so on. We've got very loose borders, and how do you shut that down? You could probably shut down interstate travel and international travel, but shutting down the city. So it's probably easier to shut down a whole state than it is to shut down an individual city. 
Uh, it ties into a question from Aya Kurashita. Why has, have transmission numbers dropped so rapidly in China? I mean, is this one of the issues that they have that social control and therefore they've, we're seeing those numbers really falling there? Yeah, assuming they're real, and I think we've got to the point where I think China has been relatively transparent. They weren't at the beginning, and that's part of the problem, real part of the problem, under-emphasized, but because they want to be polite to China. The... Um, but it's, they are coming down, and it's simply there's this number called the R naught, which is the reproductive, the reproductive, reproducibility, the reproductive element of the. Oh, sorry, I've got the term wrong. But nonetheless, how many people you infect if you're uh, infected? So if I'm infected, uncontrolled with no controls, I will infect two or three people if I've got coronavirus. What you want? Well, the aim of these public health measures is to get that R O value. Down, R is not value, down to one or less than one. And you do that by stopping people coming in contact with each other. So the extreme measures they've taken where they can find people to their homes, you can't go out to shop, uh, we'll bring the shopping to you or we'll lock you up if you're really insisting on going out, that has brought the reproductive uh, rate of the virus down to less than one and they've got tiny numbers now, if they're telling the truth. They probably are. And now the Chinese, ironically, are worried about Italy, South Korea mm. and Iran. Mm. People coming back into China. There's this real question. I mean, you know, when I see friends and family, the one thing that really strikes me is that people don't know who to trust in these circumstances. Do you feel that same sort of discomfort about this flow of information and not knowing who to trust and that's why you sort of suddenly see people panic buying toilet paper because they're just doing it just yeah. in case? Well, they can trust you and me, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, yes. Yeah, maybe. Um, so... If anybody's offering you an easy solution for mm. coronavirus and trying to sell you something that's going to control it and we've done lots of trials on it and yep. this is the magic sauce, run a mile. Yep. Nobody's got the magic sauce. If yep. they had, it would be wonderful. Um, so that's the first thing. There are no treatments at the moment. Antibiotics are not going to help you and so on. Um, Immunisation is really important. The, um, so the, you've just got to worry. I actually think that the... State and federal government websites are giving reliable information. It's updated r regularly. Now, what people like me are doing is that we are reading the journals every day. Um, and I'm not an expert. You know, call me an expert. I'm not really an expert. I, uh, but, the, but I read the journals every day and I'm picking up stuff. So the problem with that is that I, regurg I regurgitate stuff. So, I mean, and you've got to qualify it. So, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday or the day before, an interesting study looking at the evolution of the virus in China over the course of the epidemic. Some great science is coming out of China. And you know, did it go through that pangolin animal or not? And did, mm. it, did it come from bats and so on? And what's been happening with the virus? And what they found is it does go back to the bats. They don't think it's necessarily gone through this pangolin animal when they look at the genetics. Because what happens is, is each time the virus replicates, it makes mistakes in the genes. And you can time those mistakes and go back to when it started and where it came from. But what they have found is that at some point, December, January, if I got, I've got the story right, it's a difficult paper to read, it veered off and another version of the virus, which was much more aggressive, evolved and, um, and took over in many ways and then has disappeared because the Chinese have got on top of this. The people with severe illness who are probably infected with this other version of the virus have gone, gone away, and the other version, which goes straight back to the bats, the S version, there. Now, it's only 100 people. So this is not 3,000 people. It's based on 100 people. That research could be wrong. And it's got to be replicated by others. I mean, they, f they found a so man... that's a very big qualifier there it, when you're kind of talking about a sample size. Well, t the, the other one uh, is a, a study from Singapore of three patients. Yeah. Really interesting study. Um, but it's only three patients. But really detailed study. Two really sick. Didn't seem to spread it around the hospital ward. One who wasn't really sick at all. Had it in his poo. And toilet bowl, the sink, and even the cupboard that they went to for the protective gear had it. There's so much variation here that you just take things with a pinch of salt, it's early days, and the knowledge has yet to settle. And if somebody, even me, you know, the temptation is to be really definite about stuff. And some of the things today I've been definite about, which is influenza, pneumococcal vaccine, if you've got chronic disease, get it under control. That's, nobody's going to question that. But treatments, results, 
magic potions, run for the hills. Uh, I want to get one more question in if I can. I know we're sort of running out of time a little bit, but Merrin Murray has this question. If and when this becomes widespread, do we have enough medical equipment to treat all the anticipated patients appropriately? No one knows the answer to that question, which is why they're trying to slow it down. We could find intensive care bl beds blocked, ventilators blocked um, and used up, this heart-lung bypass, and uh, we, might have, we may or may not have enough protective equipment, but we may not have enough intensive care beds. We think we do. But the, the, if this went wild, we may not. Dr Norman Swan, thank you so much. And if you want to hear more from Dr Swan on the coronavirus, you can download the ABC podcast, Coronacast. And you can, of course, stay up to date with the latest information on the special coverage page. That's on the ABC News website. Go to abc.net.au slash news slash story streams slash coronavirus or just put into Google. It'll work that way too. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you so much for all your questions. We really have received so many of them. We're planning on doing these every week to keep you updated and for you to throw us your questions. The smart ones, the dumb questions, uh, nothing's bad. Uh, we hope to see you then. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now.